John and his study group were on their fifth hour of reviewing for the exam. John asks how many chapters they've done so far. His study partner tells him they've done 10 chapters when they actually only have done eight so far. This measurement lacks what? When you get a question that is asking about what the measurement is lacking, typically they'll be referring to either accuracy, reliability, or validity. So it's very important you know each of these three aspects of measurement. These three aspects are what make good measurement. Now, you could also include IOA or inter-observer agreement in there if you'd like, but these are the three main ones we need to know. So first, what is accuracy? Accuracy means the data you record reflects the true value of what actually occurred. So in this case, John wants to know how many chapters they've done so far. His study partner says 10. They've actually only done eight. Did his study partner tell John the true value of what actually occurred? Well, no, he was too over what they've actually done. He was not accurate. So what about reliability? Well, reliability means whatever we measure, we can continue to measure the same way over and over again. Now, you could measure something wrong over and over again. That's irrelevant. Think of these in a bubble, right? You can be reliable and inaccurate. We're not sure if we're reliable. We only have one data point to go off of, so we can't say for sure that we lack reliability. And then validity means we are measuring what we intend to measure. In this case, John's study partner is measuring the chapters. He's just doing it inaccurately. So our measurement is valid. We're not sure if it's reliable, but we know it's inaccurate. This measurement lacks accuracy. That's how you have to attack these accuracy, reliability, validity questions. Understand that each one occurs in a bubble. You can be valid and accurate and not reliable. You can be accurate and reliable, but not valid. Or you can be reliable and valid, but lack accuracy. Okay, It all depends on what information you're given. John's study partner is inaccurate with how many chapters they've done so far. Blaine is a decent math student, but avoids starting his work on time. When he does start, he gets easily distracted and never completes the required amount of problems within the time limit. If we wanted to target Blaine beginning his work, what measurement system should we use? Now, be careful here. When we do applied behavior questions, we need to be sure and 100% sure, meaning we need to read our questions carefully. We need to do all our work up front on the questions and know what behavior we're talking about. In this case, the question stem gives you Blaine's a decent math student. We know he avoids working on time. And we also know he gets distracted and never completes the required amount of problems within the time limit. So there's multiple things, if we wanted to, we could work on and we could target, right? But the question specifies we want to target Blaine beginning his work. So what's the issue with Blaine and beginning his work? Well, he avoids starting his work on time. Meaning I tell Blaine, get started, or I hand him a worksheet, or I give an SD, and there's too long in between the SD and Blaine starting for us to be happy or accept it as okay, right? So if we want to target this behavior, what measurement system do we need to use? Is frequency going to do us any good? Is counting how often this happen occurs going to help us? Well, no, because we already know, right? He avoids it, okay? So it really isn't going to do us a lot of good at this point if we want to actually target this skill, okay? What about duration? Well, duration is going to tell us how long Blaine works, right? How long um, it takes him to complete a worksheet. But we're not looking at that, right? We're looking at time in between. What? What time in between what? The SD and Blaine beginning his work, okay? So what we really want to target is latency. We want to decrease the latency, right, from whatever SD for starting work and Blaine actually starting the work, okay? It's taking way too long. We need to decrease that time. Now, into response time, we might use if we wanted to help Blaine complete the required amount of problems within the time limit, meaning time in between responses or into response time would need to decrease. That way, Blaine could complete more problems. But that's not what we're focused on here. What we're focused on is Blaine beginning his work, meaning the time in between the SD and Blaine starting work is too long. Let's target latency and reduce that latency. An outcome that seems to exist because of how it was measured 
but in fact does not actually exist or correspond to what occurs considered what? Now, this is a definition question. The likelihood of you seeing a question this blatantly defined, right, on the exam, it's probably lo probably low. But remember, this is practice, okay? So we, what we're trying to work on is both applied, but also making us aware of maybe some more of the obscure terms, right? People don't talk about too often, okay? You really never hear this come up in practice that much, right? Because hopefully our measurement is dialed in. Hopefully our fidelity is good, okay? But if it's not, and we see an outcome that appears to have happened, but it didn't actually happen, and the only reason it seemed like it did was because of how it was measured, what is that considered? Is that a confound? Well, a confound is a variable that we know or suspect to have affected our dependent variable. We're not talking about something affecting a dependent variable here, right? Remember, this outcome isn't actually happening, okay? It's the same thing with the extraneous variable. Extraneous variable are all the variables outside of our experiment that we want to control for. It's not what we're talking about here, okay? And then an explanatory fiction is a type of mentalism, right, where we're trying to explain away a behavior by using mentalistic terms, right? We're not doing that. We are looking at an outcome because of our incorrect measurement or the wrong measurement or whatever the measurement, whatever happened with the measurement, indicated an outcome exists when it doesn't. This is called an artifact. Again, a definition question, you probably won't see something this blatant on the exam. We're trying to draw attention to more of the, some of the more obscure, right, lesser known terms. Artifact is one of those. So hopefully we're familiarizing you with some of these lesser known terms like artifact. During an experiment, Albert's data is typically consistent, but will occasionally fluctuate significantly. Albert suspects that there is something going on in the subject's life causing those fluctuations. Whatever is going on in the subject's life is considered a what? Now, Albert is conducting an experiment. Typically, his data is consistent. Maybe Albert has good experimental control over his data, right? But occasionally, it'll fluctuate. He'll get these outliers. And Albert thinks it's because he suspects something else is going on in the subject's life. There's another variable outside of the experiment impacting the subject. We just briefly talked about this. What is that considered? Was it a negative or positive consequence? No. Remember, negative positive consequences are things like punishment, reinforcement, right? We're not talking about behavior change necessarily here, okay? Albert isn't delivering any consequences, okay? And again, we don't know enough about what variable he suspects to know if it's a consequence, an antecedent, a setting event. We're not sure, right? So we can't really get specific to a consequence. We know it's not an artifact. We just talked about what an artifact is, or what an artifact is, right? It's a, a outcome that appears to exist because of measurement. We're not talking about how Albert's measuring the behavior here, okay? What we're talking about is a confound. Albert suspects that some variable outside of his experiment is affecting the experiment and, expecting, and, and affecting the behavior, okay? And Albert is not controlling this variable. That's what makes it a confound. Now, Albert needs to figure out what it is and try to control for it, okay, because it's messing up his data. This is what we talk about during experiments when we want to have experimental control, meaning what we're doing, our independent variables are impacting the independent variables. Nothing else, no extraneous variables, no confounds, nothing else, just what we want to affect the dependent variable is affecting the dependent variable. That is a functional relation. That is experimental control. Albert here is struggling with that because of the variable outside, which is the confound. If you want to identify a verbal behavior as an echoic, what must the verbal behavior have? I always preach this. We all know verbal operants. We know a tax is a label. We know a man is a request, right? We can do that. That's RBT stuff. You're a BCBA now. You need to start thinking about verbal operants in technical terms and how they're defined both in the Cooper book and on the exam. The exam wants you to know what evokes, what reinforces, does it have point to point, and is it formally similar? That's what they want you to know. In this case, we're asking about echoics. 
And if we want to identify verbal behavior as an echoic, what must that verbal behavior have? Well, ask yourself, does an echoic verbal operant have point-to-point -point correspondence? It does. If I say dog and you say dog, that is point-to-point -point correspondence. Whatever is being communicated is identical. If I say my name is Ted and you say my name is Ted, that is point-to-point -point correspondence. Communication is identical. If I say go to the store and you, add, and you say what do you need, that is not point-to-point. What I'm communicating is different than what you're communicating. So we know an echoic has to have point to point. Now, what about formal similarity? Formal similarity means the form of communications are the same between the listener and the speaker. Written word, written word. Spoken word, spoken word. Right? Those are formally similar. An echoic does have formal similarity. And that's a tricky one with the echoics, right? We need to remember to be an echoic. It has to have point to point and it has to have formal similarity. So if you look at A, formal similarity, well, we just went over that. But do we pick A and move on? Well, no, because there might be a better answer. A is not complete. Neither is B, point to point correspondence. A and B aren't complete answers. Be very careful. You have to read every answer choice. Okay? You're going to miss questions if you don't. Read every answer choice. Because if we look at C, both formal similarity and point to point correspondence, that's what we're looking for for an echoic. Of course, D is wrong. It's the opposite of C, neither. A, yes. B, yes, but they're not complete. C is complete. If you want to identify verbal behavior as an echoic, the verbal behavior must have formal similarity and point-to-point -point correspondence. A respondent contingency is written as what? Okay. A lot of questions lately about respondent and operant conditioning, behavior, and we just made a video on that, so go check that out, okay? We need to know the difference. Respondent, con respondent conditioning or respondent behavior is based on what? It's based on antecedent stimuli, right? Because an antecedent stimuli causes a reflex. Operant behavior and operant conditioning is, is based on consequences, right? Those consequences control future behavior, okay? So a respondent contingency, how is that written? Well, we know it's not a three-term contingency, okay? There's no consequences in respondent contingencies. And it's not an if-then statement because the then is a consequence. A respondent conting contingency is written as SR. You have a stimulus and a reflex. The sun is bright, you blink. You smell pepper or you pepper goes up your nose, you sneeze. These aren't maintained by consequences. A respondent contingency is a two-term Contingency, it's written as SR. Which of the following is not one of the seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis? Okay, again, most likely will not get something this easy and this straightforward on the exam, but let's assume you do. How do we approach it? What we don't do is overthink it. What we don't do is try to spend too much time on it. All we do is look at this question understand how easy it is, and in our head, we know what are the seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis, and we need to be able, in our head, fluently to say those. So we have behavioral, analytic, technological, conceptually systematic, applied, generality, and effective. So all we're going to do now is find the answer choice that doesn't fit in those seven. A, analytic. We said analytic. B, effective. We said effective. C, empirical. We did not say empirical. It does not fit into one of the seven dimensions. It is not what we're going to choose. D, technological, does fit our seven dimensions. Which of the following is not one of the seven dimensions? C, empirical. At an initial assessment, a future client slams multiple doors in the house and asks for snacks throughout the observation. A plan is written targeting the slamming of doors, which will utilize negative reinforcement and extinction procedures. What is the dependent variable in the plan? Be careful here. There's a lot of things going on and is asking a very specific question. What do we know? We know we had an initial assessment. We know the client slams doors and we know the client asked for snacks throughout the observation. We're asking about the plan though. So in your plan, you're targeting the slamming of doors. 
and you're utilizing negative reinforcement and extinction procedures. Now, which one is the independent variable and which one is the dependent variable? So the independent variable is going to be whatever we're introducing to try and influence the behavior, which is the dependent variable. The dependent variable is dependent on the IV. In this case, our IVs are negative reinforcement and extinction. We're going to see how these procedures affect slamming of doors. So slamming of doors is going to be what? It's going to be the dependent variable. So asking for snacks is not what we're targeting. Negative reinforcement is our independent variable. Extinction is our independent variable. Our dependent variable is going to be slamming doors. We are going to introduce, withdraw, reintroduce, go through all these IVs until we find one that has a functional relationship with the DV. Until we can control the DV of slamming doors, okay, we're going to experiment. Hopefully, based on these set of questions, you can see how all these ideas and concepts are tying together. Once you can do that, okay, you're getting really close to being really good at the exam. So the dependent variable in the plan is going to be our behavior, which is slamming doors. You just passed your BCBA exam and are now working full-time as a supervisor. You learn that someone you used to date is applying at your company and wants to receive supervision hours. Assuming you are qualified and trained as a supervisor, can you provide the hours? This is what most people do when they read a question like this. They read, you just passed your BCBA exam. They know the first sentence. You learn that someone you used to date is applying. They know the second sentence. And they skip this part. They skip assuming you're qualified and trained as a supervisor. But that's very important because that rules out a lot of potential answer choices. So first question you ask yourself, well, can you give these hours? And the answer is, it depends. And it depends on what? Well, you know you've been in a relationship before with them. So is there a time limit? And that's what you have to ask yourself. What is the time limit here? What is the statute of limitations, if you will? So A, no, you cannot provide service or hours to someone who you've been in a relationship with before. Is the rule hard and fast? Is it if you've ever been in a relationship, you can't provide hours? Well, no, it's a time limit thing, right? There's a certain time or certain amount of time that has to pass before you can give supervision hours. B, no, you have to wait two years to provide supervision after passing your exam. Well, back to what we originally said. If you pick B, one, it's wrong, but two, you skipped, assuming you're qualified and trained as a supervisor. So we know you're qualified. We know you're trained. We know you don't need to wait. The issue is you dated this person before, and now they want supervision hours. Can you give them? C, yes, as long as a year has passed since the relationship ended. Or D, yes, as long as six months have passed. What one is the answer? If you don't know, you need to go back to our study guide and go back to the task list and the ethical code and review. The answer is D. Yes, as long as six months have passed since the relationship ended. Do you need to know timeframes? You absolutely need to know timeframes for a relationship. 